Hi guys, Kellen and I spend all of our time trying to figure out how to navigate complicated cannabis challenges. Today, we are excited to bring to you a solution for your accounting needs. Navigating 280E, keeping clean books, and providing financial and accounting advice is a massive headache for so many businesses. End to End is a team of CPAs with backgrounds from the big public firms that specialize in the cannabis industry. End to End is offering a no-cost consultation if you tell them the dime sent you. That's right, free accounting advice. Go to n2nadvisors.com now to take advantage of this. That's n, the number 2, n, a, d, v, i, s, o, r, s.com to get free accounting advice now. You're closer aligned with Russia and China than you are with Germany, France, Mexico, and Canada. This is The Dime. Dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Nathan Meissen, president and founder of Diplomat Consulting and co-chair of the National Cannabis Working Group for Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Nathan, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm pretty grand. Life is uh, pretty good. Lots of fun things going on in the world. So it's uh, lots of time and lots of change uh, in the cannabis sector and beyond. So fun to be a part of it. Excited to dive into a bunch of topics. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing well. There's a lot of snow on the ground out here in Colorado, and I'm really excited to talk international cannabis. Yeah, I guess for the record, Nathan, you're located north of the border. So I don't know if that goes for either the east or the west. Kellen, do you have a thought behind that? If he's in Toronto, it's east. If he's in Vancouver, it's west, right? That's right. And the rest of the country doesn't matter in Canada. So don't even worry. That's what I figured. It's just all (laughs) blank space in the rest of Canada. The only two places that matter are Toronto. We can also put Montreal in there as well. So, yeah. Fair. Welcome welcome to the Canada. Have like an East Coast versus West Coast uh, thing going on. Well, no, it's funny because Canadians, we we have to make everything a little bit more difficult. It's Central Canada, which where Ontario is, and Western Canada, because the East Canada is the Atlantic. So we, we even add another layer. So we, we make I it more it. boring in true Canadian uh, fashion while apologizing for it. So I'm sorry that I brought that to the table. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> so, so Nathan, for our listeners, can you give a little background about you and how you got into the cannabis space? Yeah. So thanks very much. Um, so been an exciting ride, having a great opportunity to help in the cannabis space from legacy. So legacy cannabis is defined in Canada. So Vancouver, uh, Canada, had a very unique circumstance. We were moving towards legalization in Canada. um, But what Vancouver did was actually approve municipal retail for cannabis prior to actual legalization. So you had a groundswell of stores that actually were popping up that were selling cannabis that was not regulated um, federally. um, And that is classified as legacy Canada or cannabis. So I was helping uh, some of the legacy cannabis retailers come into the legal sector, which as you can imagine, was an incredible transition and difficult to do because when you're used to no taxation and new, no rules, except at a municipal level, coming into um, a regulatory environment at a municipal, provincial and federal level, that is as difficult as opening a nuclear power plant was a little bit hard for those retailers to decide that they wanted to carry it through. Um, But it really spurred the opportunity of what was coming in Canada. And because we were the first G7 and the first uh, G20, I always kind of viewed this as an opportunity if if Canada didn't, you know, screw it up, is that this could be our internet. um, Because it was such an economic opportunity that was manifesting here first, where the world would look at us first and then spread it out. And we've seen that the case, like when we started legalization in 2017, two countries in the world, we're talking federal legalization, Uruguay and Canada, it's now 59 nations around the world are going through legalization. And the interesting thing from a Canadian was that we had to build our own domestic supply chain. So there's lots of interesting opportunities for Canadian expertise to come abroad. And I wanted to be a part of that because I thought there was some really interesting ways for us to help write, uh, write rules. Uh, at a city, at a, a province, state level, and a, at a federal level, uh, that made sense. So I joined with Fire and Flower um, as one of the founders. I was the first employee in Western Canada for them, and I think employee number four um, overall. In four years, they have gone from you know literally selling ether, like this is coming, this is coming, you have to believe it's coming, to 101 stores across Canada, four stores in the United States, and they're now partnered with Circle K. 
Um, so the 16,000 stores worldwide that Circle K has potentially in the future could have fire and flower. So being a part of, of a company that went through that kind of growth with that kind of um, parent that uh, come, came on board was an incredible opportunity to help write the regulatory framework at the city, provincial, and, and federal level. And so I was very involved in, in helping do that, uh, running their government relations, regulatory affairs, and communication sides for Fire and Flower. And uh, they really afforded me the opportunity to help set up a number of the provincial uh, associations, as well as the federal association. So that's, uh, you threw it out there, why I became the co-chair of the National Cannabis Working Group of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. I was the past chair of the Alberta Cannabis Council. and the Ontario Cannabis Policy Committee. So they really afforded that uh, that opportunity for us to help write the rules which cannabis retail was written on. And it's uh, spurred some incredible passion in me about what the economic sector and the opportunity that it, it can be. And I don't know if you guys saw the Deloitte report that was just dropped on Monday out of Canada. We can talk about some pretty freaking big numbers and uh, some pretty exciting opportunities that maybe this is our internet if we don't screw it up. So I think there's uh, lots of opportunities and to represent that, you know, uh, at a municipal, provincial, state, and international level, it doesn't happen very often. So it's been a crazy ride, and and to see the explosion and acceptance of cannabis is pretty exciting. Yeah, it's got to be exciting. And I want to stay with kind of the original framework that you were putting together. Obviously, we've talked about when you're leaning on other previous policies like New York, who can lean on California and Denver to kind of do the right ways. When you're in that room for the first time, and you're saying it's only you and another country. There's no other countries you can lean on for framework or for references. So that has to be another layer of complexity and challenges because you're not only fighting the stigma of the unknown, you don't have anyone to kind of lean on and say, look, they've done it successfully. This is what we can steal from. Well, and, you know, big up Uruguay, right? But yeah. Uruguay is not Canada. So Canada doing it was going to be the basis of probably what everybody else, like since Canada went through the legalization process, we just talked about it, it went from two countries in the world to 59. Right. It was the first Commonwealth nation that did it. There's now 24 Commonwealth nations that are going through cannabis legalization right now. They're probably going to use common law based on the Commonwealth practice of Canada law to be able to do it. And I think it's a really, really, really good point, because when you do something domestically, the unintended consequences internationally are so profound sometimes that it impacts the follow up. So just a quick example on that. So, you know, the federal Liberal Party led by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who pushed this initiative forward, this is probably one of the most significant social policy or economic policies when people look back at he'll be known for, right? Like this is building a worldwide economy that has built on. But it was freaking hard to do that because you had to push that down through three orders of government. Right. To, to get the federal to legalize, then you have to have the province build the distribution system and the retail environment. And then you have to have the cities decide how they're going to zone it. Can it be close to daycares, schools, libraries, all of that stuff? I think one of the really unique things is we were in violation of three international treaties when we actually legalized cannabis, including the Controlled Substance Treaty, which is a little bit of a big deal when it comes to international policy, because that's how you move drugs across the country or across the world, including pharmaceuticals. So China and Russia, who had fairly significant negative feelings of cannabis, if they wagged their finger at Canada and said that we were in violation, pharmaceutical drugs could have stopped being sent to Canada because of our legalization. So what happened is we legalized. Then the federal government was like, we didn't legalize, right? Like, pretend we didn't do anything and then get the province and the, the municipalities to do it all because they didn't want to piss off the international consequences of what it would mean. And it's interesting how sometimes how, you know, political sensitivities and cover our own ass when it comes to big decisions that sometimes politicians make that have huge consequences, both economically and society, turn out to be in really good things. So their decision of the Canadian federal government to lower its eyes actually meant we had to build a domestic supply chain because we were establishing a completely new domestic market for cannabis legalization from production to retail. But everybody forgets about lawyers, accountants, building, who's going to wrap the windows, who's going to do security, what are the computers that are going to hold that data system, who's doing point of sales, who's doing merchant of financing, you know, all of those other pieces. But what's really crazy about that is that's now businesses that Canadians can actually take 
and export to the world. Because let's be honest, cultivation and retail is tough to take to the world because you have regulatory environments. Advisors and ancillary businesses, they can go wherever the hell they want. So the economic opportunity, now that we're finally lifting our eyes up and saying, oh, yeah, we did legalize. Um, OK, you can pay attention to us again, um, you know, is creating some really exciting opportunities for Canadian businesses and, and Canadians to offer that uh, that opportunity abroad. And that's a really exciting possibility to create a regulatory framework that looks like yours, where domestic businesses know how to work in um, internationally and Scaling is not something that Canadian businesses are known very well for uh, internationally. So it's a really exciting time where if we, again, don't screw it up, this could be a, our internet kind of thing. I have a quick question. How much of an impact did working at Fire and Flower have on your ability to speak accurately in these conversations when you guys are drafting the regulations and putting these rules in place? I think it's a great question because, you know, when you're building relationship with regulators and politicians, they of course know you're coming in with a slant, right? Like, like they know that you're advocating for a mutual, a mutually beneficial solution that perhaps gives you a preference over others. But if you think about how they're going to sell it, how it fits in with their agenda, and how it actually benefits all of the sector. Um, there is opportunities to see significant advancement in that. And because the sector was so new, right, and because it was start-stop at the beginning of cannabis legalization, like there was nine stores in Alberta, and then it was like, whoa, whoa, we don't have enough domestic supply. We're not going to approve any more retail uh, stores for eight or for nine months, right, to have the supply catch up. And now we're like, there's too much supply, and now there's too much retail stores. So it was interesting because you were telling people like, hey, this is coming. And they're like, well, we don't believe you, you know. Um, no, 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 there's not enough supply. And it's like, there's 9 million square foot facilities that have been built. Like, there's an extra 1.2 billion grams in Canada of cannabis right now that cannot be sold because our domestic market can't handle it. 1.2 billion grams, right? So um, it's a really good point. You have to advocate for the middle, show them that you understand their point of view and give them um, speaking points that is a win for them and a win for your company and the sector you're looking to establish. And I think, you know, the fact that Fire and Flower was so generous in, in letting me and financial contribution and setting up a lot of the associations that represented um, the, the cannabis sector at a, at a provincial and, and national level, it allowed us to have a diverse voice while still having intrinsic ties to one player. And I think that was ben very beneficial as well. But, you know, regulators often just want a solution. And if you're willing to put in the work to help them get there, they're willing to listen, even though that they know that there might be a little bit of biases in there. That was well said. I want to stay on that topic because it's so interesting. And I never really thought about like the international, I guess, peer pressure that would have ensued if they turned and started wagging their fingers. So is that a consideration before that's legalized? Or do you think that's kind of like a post, oh, I didn't realize that this was going to be received so negatively? Well, now that's a great question. So there's two different elements in most policy development, right? Politicians and bureaucracy, right? So the, we all know that the bureaucracy might have been running around in circles with their hand above their head, screaming like they were on fire, that we were in violation to that stuff. And the political class could be like, we made a promise, let's get it over the line because we're pandering to 18 to 35 year olds and we're going to make this happen hell or high water. And the guys who are running around in circles that are screaming, they can take care of the international consequence because I don't even know if I'll be here in the future. So, you know, I think you have to find that happy balance between the two. But, you know, there was some movement in other jurisdictions to already see cannabis move. Australia was talking about it. New Zealand was talking about it. Germany was talking about it. Uh, South Africa was talking about it. Mexico was talking about it. So I, I think that's a, a really, that was very beneficial. And again, I think it's also quickly just important in the Canadian context to understand cannabis legalization came through the judiciary, right? It was patients suing for access to better medicinal cannabis. And because we have common law under the Commonwealth, you know, that is um, judicial precedent in all Commonwealth nations. 
So when the South Africans uh, legalized cannabis through their Supreme Court ruling, it was based on the Canadian Supreme Court case. So they they knew that the, the ball could have been rolling at that point. So I think it was like, oh, shit, this could be a consequence, but the ball's already out of the thing. We made a promise. Let's go get those 18 to 35 year olds. And hopefully the bureaucrats can steer us out of the, the darkness if we get in too much trouble. Yeah, it's so that's such a complicated puzzle pieces of, of situ- situations and personalities and political understandings that I'll never even be able to probably comprehend. Well, and, and the thing is, just as a quick aside on that, is uh, the World Health Organizations and the United Nations in 2020, I'm sorry, late 2019, did amend the Controlled uh, Substance Treaty to actually exempt CBD and um, add, declassify cannabis from a Class A felony, right? Like, or as a Class A inhibitor. Um, so, you know, the they also had been advocating at some of the organizations with the treaties that specifically if the Russians and the Chinese got really mad at us, there was movement to change some of that international treaties. And I'm sure that went into the calculus behind the scenes with the bureaucrats who were running around and screaming uh, that fire, fire, world's on fire. Um, so, you know, it was, it, to your point, it's a complicated web and it's a bold statement for a country to go first in that environment and then have everybody chase it. And it's interesting because the rules are so strict in Canada because it was easier to sell strict rules that you could roll back. Um, and that's one of the environments that we now find ourselves in. Yeah, it's it's a lot easier to kind of loosen the restrictions than it is to be to, to put them on first and then be like, whoa, 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 we got to tighten this up because you've got to walk back that experience and change the customer perception as well as the business operations. So kind of staying... Colin, yeah, go for it. Colin was a great example of that. Colorado with the edibles, right? Like the fact that there was no edible cap at the beginning. People were buying 1,000 milligram cakes and then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, we shouldn't give 1,000 milligram cakes, right? It was like, we have to lower that political rule that and a bureaucratic rule is always give easier to give to the citizenry than take something away. So make it as strict as possible where you can lose it in time. And I think they use some of the Colorado example um, specifically in that circumstance on our cal- uh, cannabis policy. I mean, Florida definitely did where they wouldn't, didn't even allow you to buy cannabis flour to smoke, right? Which is yeah. the industry, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's wild. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there was an economic uh, influence or an economic kind of major point behind it saying, hey, if we do go first, we can capture like a, a bigger opportunity and position the businesses for potential exposure if and when the other countries follow suit? Or you think it was kind of like, hey, we think this is a good idea. We should do it because it can help the citizens here. I think that's a great question. And the answer is categorically no. They did not care about the economics because, again, this was a Health Canada-led thing because of the Supreme Court uh, ruling. And that's been one of the worst things that's actually happened for the cannabis sector. Because, you know, when you have to go up against people who believe reefer madness, that you have to go up with people who are trenched in the tropes of the past, one of the ways to crack that is like, hey, this is generating $43 billion of economic impact and 151,000 direct and indirect jobs in the last three and a half years and has continued to grow during COVID as perhaps one of Canada's greatest COVID economic success stories, but they didn't give a shit. So, you know, an interesting thing, and I think this is a really important thing to, uh, to keep in mind, is there is not one provincial or federal economic mandate at one ministry or ministerial purview for the economics of cannabis. A sector that is now larger than dairy, forestry, mining, and automotive production has nobody who gives a shit about the jobs that it creates in this country. And I think that is one of the fascinating lessons that other countries have learned, is if you see what Mexico did, South Africa did, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, they've all added an economic mandate. And that's something that Canada has given to the world because we didn't have to do it and the politicians realized, hey, this creates a lot of jobs and a lot of revenue, a lot of government revenue. We should maybe build in the economics into it at the beginning as well. Um, so I think that's a lesson that Canada gave to the to the world as going first, because we really screwed that up here at home. Let's talk about one of the challenges of advocating for some of those political stances. I know you you have your fair share of experiences and probably some stories about maybe some vaping and some of the taxes that go into mm-hmm. it. 
Yeah, going into um, ministers' boardrooms and them telling you that there's no illegal vape products in the the place that you're advocating for, and you're like, oh, minister, please tell me more. And they, they categorically tell you, illegal cannabis is not in this jurisdiction. And you perhaps open up a large um, uh, app that you can order cannabis from illegally, and you order vape products for them and to be delivered to that ministerial boardroom and then hit refresh over and over so the minister can literally see the dot moving closer and closer to be delivering illegal cannabis to his office in uh, a legislative building is pretty emphatic on um, you know your advocacy point. So it's, re- it's really fun to have those stories because it puts a real world example to the, the level of um, ignorance arrogance and education that the cannabis sector had to provide to people who are so oblivious to actually what is uh, the sector is trying to displace and create to. And I think, you know, that's a simple example where it was literally somebody telling you like, it doesn't exist. And it's like, we legalized to displace a sector that had an 80 year head start that contributes six and a half billion dollars um, to the economy each year from your own federal stats organization. And you're telling me it doesn't exist because we're in this province. Come on. So I, I think there's lots of things that, you know, that it seems ridiculous in con- in, in hindsight, but it shows the work that the cannabis sector has had to do to provide even that baseline of education for the people who are making the decisions on how this sector actually operates and legislated under, that they have zero idea about what the sector is, what it is, how it works, what you're working towards. And that's probably a lesson that as, you know, the states pushes forward on legalization or other jurisdiction, there has to be some education on the difference between illegal and legal so that policymakers understand why you're making a move in that direction and the economic opportunities that came for that because Canada failed in that regard. And that's probably a lesson that we can again share to the world because it made advocacy much harder. Isn't that frightening though? Like the fact that the people who are making the rules have no idea what's going on. I mean, I love going back to the example of Governor Ricketts of Nebraska. If you legalize cannabis, it will kill your kids. And I just can't get that out of my head because how in this day and age does he say something like that unless he's 100% tunnel visioned in or someone's provided him a talking script and he's like, this is what my lobbyists want me to say. This is what I'm going to say. It's also interesting the changes in attitude when money starts to come involved. Yeah. When yes. Illinois tax revenue uh, showed that they were making more money off cannabis than they were on alcohol. It was so interesting bad. how many states started to be like, hey, whoa, whoa, wait, what? What say? What was that you were saying? More, more money than alcohol? Um, we like more money. Um, or you know, former police officers who at one time in my own country said that cannabis was the same as murder, and they now own cannabis companies, right? Like it's it's interesting how things can evolve um, uh, through through the process. So what I think is, as we move through normalization and societal acceptance, some of those. Statements that are made that people will look back and realize, oh, man, I was really stupid or ignorant saying that, um, you know, hopefully they they have enough self-confidence in themselves to realize that was a really stupid thing they said, because it's not the same. But it does leave an interesting conversation from a policy point of view. And I, I would imagine that considering who you guys are, that's an interesting one. I've always thought it would be really interesting to do an economic analysis on a cost to government on a cross comparison between alcohol and cannabis as an ebrick. Um, I would love for somebody to fund that. Um, I would imagine I'm probably going to get some unique feedback from maybe some of the people in the the alcohol and cannabis sector. But, you know, if you want to do a true cost to society uh, on inebriants, let's actually have a foundation of information that we can cross reference against each other to make good policy decisions. Because I don't know about you, I don't see a lot of people fighting at the end of the night uh, when they're high over a pack of Doritos that perhaps you might see in with other inebriates or or taking up hospital beds because overconsumption. So I, I think there's some really interesting things that as the sector continues to evolve, we can we can see some good research and some good policy development. The only yeah, thing that's happening there is those people are falling asleep on the couch. 
Yes. <laughs> full, with full bellies. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Netflix and chill actually means Netflix and sleep, but you know, they still call it. Yes. That. Yeah. Yes. I also don't think that like, I mean, we probably don't need to conduct the experiment as far as the cost on society when you compare alcohol to cannabis. Um, I mean, I, I think it's pretty cut and dry personally, as far as, I mean, I don't know anyone that's ever blacked out on cannabis and made really poor decisions. You know what I mean? So <laughs> but you, but you, we'll just leave it there, right? <laughs> but, but so the interesting, but, so that's, a, but it's an interesting point. And it comes back to the story about the vape, right? Like vape doesn't, isn't illegal in my province. It doesn't exist, right? When you're facing with that level of misunderstanding, we sometimes have to show the cost comparison because they that's understand point. one side because it has 80 to 100 years of familiarity and they have no reference to the other side. So we have to draw that direct comparison so that there's an apples to apples conversation so that we can make better policy from a common level of understanding. And that understanding has to come from a third party, unbiased organization. Yes. Makes yes. sense. Yes. There's like a bunch of layers of challenges here, right? From a political standpoint, and maybe Nathan, you can probably weigh in better than I can. I'll just make some assumptions here is that if you're a political figure who's who's pushing for certain policy and let's say al- big alcohol is one of your biggest backers, they might not want to see cannabis kind of take some of their market share because when I've seen some of the estimates for here in New York and some of the potential numbers are just mind blowing to begin, I don't even know how they're making those numbers because right there's adoption for current cannabis consumers, which they don't know how many people, they don't know what's going on in a black market standpoint, but also the users who are now consuming alcohol on a regular basis that might migrate over and capture some of that market share. I don't know how you can put a number on that. And if I'm an alcohol company now, I'm frightened by the concept because the hangover is terrible, right? It's, it's quote unquote, makes you feel bad. You don't want to get up in the morning and work out. But from a cannabis standpoint, it kind of alleviates that burden. So there has to be some fear from alcohol side that like they might lose market share and pretty quickly. So a couple of things and I, I think I, you know, I agree with most of the thing, but look at the play of alcohol companies into the cannabis sector. Constellation with Canopy, Molson with Trust, um, you know, uh, Boston Brewing with um, looking to enter into the cannabis space in Canada. You know, there is a natural affiliation to that. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, we've heard some of the, the decelerated consumptions of beer in the United States with a younger population of 18 to 13 or 18 to 35, right? But that's a demographic that consumes cannabis at a higher level than other demographics. So, you know, you can start making unique financial decisions on how to play in both worlds to both demographics to continue to move it forward. And I think you really raise an interesting point and one of the greatest opportunities that the Canadian cannabis market has, but I, I think a worldwide market has, is the establishment of a cannabis tourism and hospitality environment. So the number in Canada is 21.5 to 25% of Canadians consuming cannabis based on, you know, based on a number of different numbers. So in a country of 39 million people, um, you know, that, that's not an insignificant population base. But it's interesting if you think about it from a policy point of view, people aren't fighting for the 75 to 79 percent, right? Of which, by the way, are the statistics are most of that demographic would be interested in trying cannabis, but through ingestibles, right? 66 percent of first time cannabis users want to have an ingestible experience. And that's not like a combustible. That's a drink. That's a, a mocktail that has an isolate or a distillate. That's a food-based experience that has a measured dosing that they can have. And to the conversation that we're having before about that parallel between alcohol and cannabis, that they can make a direct parallel to, oh, if I have one shot of of something, I feel the effects in eight to 12 minutes. Okay, if I have this mocktail with this isolate, I feel the effects in eight to 12 minutes in the same environment that I can have a drink. That's when we start to, to see a greater societal use of cannabis. I think in that regard, and considering COVID has completely beat up the, uh, the tourism and hospitality sector, right? So I, I can I know the statistics in, in Canada. I unfortunately don't know it in the states, but I'll give you one in here. So uh, Canadian tourism and hospitality contributed 105 billion dollars to the Canadian economy per year prior to COVID. It's now down to 50 billion. 
right? A $55 billion. And the crazy thing about that number, and now I'm really policy geeking, so I do apologize for it, is that is an overrepresentation of a sector that hires the most underemployed 18 to 25 year olds. So you beat up a sector that is the bridge to get younger people into um, uh, the job market as well by losing more than 48, or sorry, 55% market share. What an interesting opportunity in Canada, we'll say as an example, to have a differentiated experience when the light bulb gets turned back on and people can start to travel that 29% of worldwide consumers want a cannabis experience when it uh, when they arrive in that jurisdiction. Why can't we fill some of that $55 billion by creating a cannabis experience where 29% of the world travelers come to Canada, where the alcohol companies own some of the cannabis companies that are providing drinks that people can feel the effect with, like they do in alcohol, in an environment at pubs, festivals, music venues, so on and so forth. So there's a direct parallel. And I think that's perhaps one of the most exciting developments that are coming for the cannabis sector. Um, I think it's really exciting that New York has talked about consumption lounge licenses as well as Michigan. And I think it's a really interesting opportunity for North America, who has three of the biggest nations in it, right? The only three nations in it that are all in different stages of federal legalization to add that as something that they should be perhaps talking about as well. But I think to, to have a long-winded way, um, alcohol is a, has, a long, has a way to help steward and advocate for that kind of regulatory change um, with the relationships politically that they already exist and both cannabis on to get the cannabis further, this, uh, sector further along on that adoption. I agree. I think that cannabis and alcohol need to hold hands and kind of walk off into the sunset together. I know Brian's shaking his head, so I'm excited to hear what he has to say after this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe in the situations where the big alcohol companies partner with the, the cannabis companies, then sure, it's time. But I think alcohol well, you companies... Could ex- pick your experience, right? If you're Constellation and you then have the, someone enters, you get 100% conversion rate when someone enters your pub. You know Good what I mean? If they're going to buy a beer or if they're going to buy a THC drink versus... If you're only selling the beer, and then maybe it's a every other alcohol industry should take a every other alcohol company should be taking notes right now. You know what I mean? All right, go cool. ahead. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> I agree with that. That's totally fine. But what about the alcohol companies that don't have exposure to the to the cannabis companies? Mm-hmm. Those are the ones who are like, absolutely not, Nathan. We need some more time. We need to build our strategy. We need to have more board meetings to discuss the same concept we've talked about for probably 10 years. And when we make that acquisition, then, Nathan, it's time to open up the cannabis, the consumption lounges. They're like the bureaucrats that were running, uh, running around in circles with their hands above exactly. their heads, screaming fire and fire before, right? Now, but I think one of the things that's interesting, and, and I think this is going to be a very different experience between the Canadian uh, tourism and hospitality sector and the uh, United States tourism and hospitality sector. Canada will not allow cohabitation of any you will not be able to have cannabis and alcohol in the same jurisdiction. You just won't. Why? Yeah, why? Because there is not good, because in Canada, we legalized medicinal first, that then became adult use recreation. Okay. This lives at Health Canada as the primary regulatory agency federally. And there is not peer-reviewed research on how the two inebriants work together we cannot make decisions that will allow those two things to happen together until we do 10 years of research, innovation, um, endocannabinoid measurements on how alcohol matches together with CBD, CBN, THC, THEA, all of that stuff. It just won't happen. And what's interesting is, and this is where the, the Americans are going to have to make an interesting decision when they're regulatory is, the world's going to follow Canada in that regard, not the state. So in nations that will legalize pharmaceutical first and then and then go to adult use, like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Germany. So uh, that'll be a really interesting circumstance. Non-alcoholic beer infused with cannabis? Sure. Giggity. Um, uh, a faux wine that has cannabis in it? Yep. But the two things together, you will not have them cohabitated in the same location, which I is see. a good and bad thing. 
I could see it going where like I've I've seen a couple of consumption lounge designs out in California here in Denver with the recent passing. And like the way the loophole around that, right, is they just literally put two locations next to each other and then they have to bypass between a door and like you can't carry your cannabis drink to your bar, you can't carry alcoholic drink back, but like you can go to the the consumption lounge, hang out, maybe have a doobie with your friends, and then go back to the the bar where the show is playing. I've seen it kind of approach from that sense. But also I've even brought up the fact that like Lagunitas and some of these other more established breweries have tried have experimented with putting cannabinoids in their beer. And the regulators, the alcohol regulators were like, absolutely not. Even with CBD, they literally pulled the plug on it faster than you could even imagine. And probably has to do with those uh, laws that you're, or those, the lack of studies that you were just mentioning. Well, and and even to your point, you'll never have smoking. Like that's an interesting Canadian difference to the States as well, which is a good thing for your tourist market. Because as we know, flour represents what? 66% of the cannabis. Of sales currently. Yeah, of current sales. You'll never have it in Canada. You will never have smoking indoors in Canada where somebody is smoking a pipe, a hookah, a joint. It just won't happen. Like, yeah, it and it shouldn't. Won't. It's it's better for the industry as a whole mm. that we're not encouraging people to inhale things that are on fire. Right? <laughs> like, at the fundamental level. This is why I think the hospitality um, is such an attractive opportunity from a market segment perspective. Especially to steward in an undertapped or untapped demographic, which by the way, is the vast majority of the society, that if we could bring them in, it's new market share, new opportunity, and politically motivated people who could actually represent, hey, this cannabis thing isn't too bad. Maybe you got out of the way because I'm not smoking it. Um, I would like to go have a drink down at uh, you know, a, a pub or a, wherever it is, right? So that you could actually have that. So. I think that's a really exciting opportunity. And I think 2022 is going to see big advancements on that area in Canada and beyond on the cannabis tourism and hospitality. And if I can hopefully play a small part in, in bashing my head against a wall to make through, uh, to get that happen, um, I'll be excited to, to see what we can achieve on that regard. I love the consumption lounge idea. And I think from educational side, you bring in consumers who are maybe a little more fearful to walk into like a normal yes. dispensary and ask those questions. And you kind of take them through the experience. You know, when you go out to California and you have the wine experience and the, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're taking you through the grapes and, and, and how it's processed and all those beautiful things, you know, maybe learn one or two different things and you feel good. You go back home and you brag to your family, but you know, I only drink, you know, Pinots from Oregon you can do the same thing in Canada where you go through that experience, you know, say, oh, well, I got these great genetics and these strains are where I like. Local food, local cannabis, local chefs, only in that jurisdiction. So we call them farm gates in Canada. They are moving in that regard, which is a similar model to the wineries, but they haven't bolted on consumption yet. That is probably to come. And, um, you know, in in Canada, we have the Niagara region for wine or the 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 um, the Kelowna area, the Okanagan Valley for wine, just like you guys have California, Oregon. Um, and though you'll see that cannabis opportunities, because again, the benefit is from a policy point of view is, oh, we did that for wine and it was incredibly successful and bought a ton of tourists here with more money. I understand that parallel. So it's easier for the politician or the, 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 the policymaker to see that and advance that cause to get us further to that. The more that we can find parallels to get the cannabis sector a, a further ahead, the better, because that's how we actually advance the cause. Um, and considering this is the third year of the Cannabis Act in Canada, October 17 of 2021 was the third year, and it has embedded in the act something that was in hindsight, incredibly intelligent, which was a full legislative review of the act, we can actually advocate for the change that we want to actually lessen some of that stringentness that we that we started with, that we talked about earlier. But we can start having conversations about like, hey, can we do infuse restaurants with a dosing station or uh, the creation of a cannabis chef or a cannabis mixologist? Now the act is open. Can we push that we can get into that point of view. And and that's a really exciting opportunity for us to see regulatory change to get us to that environment. Um, So it's going to be a big year. So I want to slightly switch gears on the topic standpoint. So what's 
Canada's perception of the U.S. and how they're handling the process or the rollout of uh, cannabis? Well, that's a great question. So Canadian license holders, which are the cultivators, are please, for the love of God, hurry up and federally do it so that we can push our 1.2 billion extra grams of cannabis down there into your market. While Oregon, Washington, and Colorado are like, please, for the love of God, let federal legalization happen so that we can push our hundreds of thousands of pounds to the rest of the country. That's an interesting circumstance. We'll figure out how that plays out in the market. Um, I think bolting that um, on to uh, the the Mexico um, movement as well is a really interesting one because you have potentially cannabis uh, potentially be a part of the USMCA negotiations in the future. So you have a North American purview. Hell, even if we just start at hemp, which we've approved across, now you have a North American CBD um, and non psychoactive cannabinoid market. That's a really interesting point of view. I think. Canadian companies and regulators have started to lose faith that federal legalization is imminent. I think, you know, the political discourse in the States is pretty fragmented. Um, So Canadians are looking at other jurisdictions. And I say this a lot on conversations with the States, and I feel bad because I feel like I'm always like the negative Nancy of, of opportunity for Americans. Um, But the fact that there is going to be a worldwide standard for cannabis, probably based around EU GMP production because of the size of the European market and because the federal government isn't involved in that conversation, it could potentially lock uh, um, um, American cannabis in America. Canada is starting to look at Germany, France, Europe, as a significant place to divert their attention to, especially because the Americans are trapped in their own border with their cannabis. Oh, I, I, I think that's a really right? interesting point of view. So again, it's like Germany. They are doing business. Yeah, they, they do because we legalize the same way because it's medicinal first. So it's pharmaceutical grade based on EU GMP standards yeah. of production. And because the, the States hasn't legalized in the same manner with that same kind of regulatory environment. And the benefit is that's medicinal to medicinal, not recreational to recreational. So you can have medicinal products um, that is pharmaceutical grade flow between countries of which there's potentially 58 around the world that are going through that process while the States is trying to figure out what it is. So you're going to see much more um, attention from Americans or from Canadian regulators and companies to those jurisdictions. I will flag one, just one quick thing for an interesting point of view. So Canada has had a fairly protectionist experience when it comes to cannabis domestic supply from outside sources to the point where Jamaica and Colombia has threatened the Canadian domestic market with protectionism at the WTO for not fulfilling its world international treaty obligations between nations. So that is actually starting to pop off which is going to be a really interesting thing to watch when it comes to domestic international flow of cannabis. Because could you imagine the World Trade Organization leaning in on trade agreements for cannabis and the states isn't at fault at that table? That's a that's a weird thing to happen. So there's some really interesting stuff internationally and, and the states being where they're at is, is really hurting their commercialization opportunities worldwide. I just have one quick question. What does the USMCA, what is that acronym that you threw in there for our listeners? United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. It's not as sexy as it was when it was called NAFTA. Um, That is the new NAFTA. They didn't like the name NAFTA because the feedback was US had to be in front of the other countries um, (laughs) when they renamed it. uh, Literally, that was the reason for it. So it is now the United States, Mexico, Canadian agreement. That is the the, the new name for NAFTA. Well, it's, right. it's good that we didn't let our ego get in the way when we were naming a, an agreement. <laughs> I mean, being left out of those sort of like conversations just because we can't get our act together is is so complicated because like you were saying, Nathan, like here in the States, we're it's a state it's a state led story. And what we don't have as a federal level is is a somewhat of an understanding of a plan moving forward. Or at least if there is, it doesn't seem like there's a clear one. So when Canada's looking to, let's say, expand their operations and they're limited with which direction they can go, right, they can either be passive and wait for the U.S., which is kind of challenging, 
or they can take that to Europe. It's a bad sign for U.S. because there's good opportunities as well from an exposure standpoint, right? Economies of scale, just based on the sheer location. That's got to be another layer of hurdle that the U.S. operators is going to fall before. Yeah, for sure. I can I completely agree. And but I, I think, you know, America will do what America has always done very well and better than most other nations on earth. Build great brands and and have great access to capital. Right. So when they do come to market, it'll be like gobble, 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 right? You'll 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 have foreign entrance into those markets by acquiring other nations, especially because when you go through federal legalization. You can see some of the bigs who are listed financially on large stock exchange where they can't get involved with cannabis because they would avail themselves off the the, the proceeds of crime, um, move off the sign lines. The other one, too, that I think is under talked about is family trusts that have vice clauses in them. You have big hedge funds and big family trusts who are sitting on the sidelines, not touching the cannabis sector because they're not allowed to because it is a vice, because it is not legal. I think when that light turns, it'll be just acquisition. And like, hell, look, Cookies just opened a location this week in Spain, right? So you're already seeing brands move in a true way that Americans are great at. Like Americans build better brands than almost any other nation on earth. So you'll export brands, you'll figure out how to work in that jurisdiction, and then you'll acquire those domestic companies when when the, the, the Band-Aid is ripped off. Put on. That analogy is a weird one, but yeah, however that would work. It's going to be a wild time when that goes down. So Nathan, it'll it'll be very, it'll be very interesting because all of the money who's been sitting on the side will just push. And the interesting thing that when you have all the money sitting on the outside is you don't have all the places to put it. So the valuations and the stupidity that are going to come on the other side of that is going to be pretty problematic because Canada can show you. When you have speculated companies, the problem is when you get high, high valuations, you have to show profitability and sustainability at a certain point. And when those come crashing down together, it's not always a good thing. So that'll be an interesting thing to see when uh, when that happens. And I look forward to uh, enjoying the ride and crying on the way down. Yeah, I hope not. Uh, what is one idea or concept about Canadian cannabis policy that Americans wouldn't know? That the provincial governments in almost every jurisdiction is the only wholesale, wholesaler and supplier for retail. So you only have one person to buy from in most jurisdictions in, in Canada, who is the government, who takes money on the front end from the cultivator and the back end from the retailer, to the point where that Deloitte report that came out that we referenced earlier showed $43.5 billion of economic contribution to the Canadian economy since legalization. And 15 billion of that went to tax policy or taxation. That is a big nut. So, and that's because the government was smart, smart, depending on which side you are and put themselves in the middle. So you can't go anywhere else. They've given themselves government monopoly where they get to set the prices and negotiate the cut on what they'll uh, buy for. It's a pretty tough place to be. It's a great business. You think that'll be the same way long term, or you think that eventually the companies will look to to push back on that? No, we've been pretty proud that we've already seen some significant change. Alberta, the jurisdiction where I live, had just closed their government monopoly e-commerce website. So in the province that I lived in, they were the only e-commerce and delivery website. They've now closed that so that private companies can actually have access to e-commerce and delivery. So I I think there will continue to be changes. Um, And it's not like the government can't get its touch and get out of the business of being a wholesaler and distributor without taking the capital cost of it. We have lots of other sectors that we could probably point to, I don't know, like alcohol, that you do the exact same thing in um, where you still take taxation on the top, but private sectors get to be the wholesaler and distributor. So I think it'll get there, but it made sense when it was easier to uh, give it to citizenry than take it away. So they controlled supply at the beginning and they controlled the revenue because nobody knew what the hell this was going to look like because we were the first G20 country in the world to do it. So it was a safer alternative to tell the citizens, you control it. It makes sense, honestly, especially with like an emerging market like that. And I mean, who knows how poor service could have been from a startup company that's trying to figure it out on the fly. They don't kind of have that professionalism that comes with the government organization. So 
I mean, I think it's smart from the beginning and it's cool that they're able to change it now. Yep. Yeah. The government's and not keep some of us employed or with consulting contracts. So that's also a good thing too. <laughs> it probably looks really nice on an Excel sheet. They're like, see, we're making twice as much. Yeah. yeah. 43.1% is the taxation on cannabis in the province that I live in. How do you so, displace an illegal market when the consumer without markup at a retail level pays 43.1% before the product is even on the shelf for sale? That's insane. That's insane. That's insane. It's hard to understand that. Like hearing you say that, like you just think about it from like a numerical standpoint, it's still hard to understand. It's that. crazy. It's crazy. I mean, even, even here in Colorado, percent. even here in Colorado, like I, there's dispensaries or storefronts that I'll pay 20, 30% taxes on. Mm-hmm. But the cannabis is still cheaper now than it was 10 years ago in the legacy market. Like significantly cheaper, like insanely cheaper compared to at least in Colorado, right? Industrial in agriculture's. Industrial agriculture is a whole hell of a thing, right? Like when you open millions and millions and millions of square feet and acres and acres and acres of outdoor grow, you all of a sudden have a cheaper product because now there's more of it, right? So that's a good thing for consumers, a bad thing for the growers, right? So that has to be the counterbalance between the two. But they don't have to worry about the feds rolling in now, right? That would be the counterpoint, I guess. (laughs) They're yeah. not going to well, like that. Federal bill, I think that they're talking 25% taxation at a federal level as well. So that'll be interesting to see how wow. that works out if that bill goes forward. So yeah, the taxation policy is going to be very interesting to watch in the States. And I would recommend that uh, American companies look at Canada because there's some really good stats-based analysis that we would love to share so that hopefully we can help arm you with some of that policy and, and research to advocate for better decision-making. So one of the things that you ask what people can know about the Canadian space that American companies don't know, we've done a lot of this. Give us a call because we'd love to share with you so that we can make better policies. And we hopefully prevent you from falling on your face because it really hurts to fall on your face and then step up and try and fix it. So if we can work together to create a better example of what a cannabis market can be, um, Canadian companies are happy to share that uh, lessons with uh, um, with American compatriots. Since you've been in the cannabinoid industry, what has been the biggest misconception? Well, that's a really interesting conversation. So I, <laughs> that I didn't support legacy, you know, because I worked for a retailer that was seen as like one of the real white collar corporate cannabis companies that was so out in front and significant development, people didn't see that we were advocating for the entire sector. Um, they saw that we were just advocating for better policies for uh, for fire and flower and, and, and for corporate cannabis and uh, not understanding that, you know, to build a better sector that displaces the, elect, uh, the, the illegal sector. I was advocating for as many of legacy people to come into the market as easy as possible because we want their better cannabis and you're going to displace the illicit sector by bringing people in as quick as possible and easy as possible. And I think that was a real challenge that um, I got beaten up a whole bunch from people who thought, you know, uh, I wasn't supportive of the whole sector. It was just the the, cor- the big corporate, and that was not the case. As I'm sure you know, there can be some vitriol from uh, certain segments uh, these days on social media and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, you can get beat up pretty good about it. But, you know, considering I argue with politicians for a, li- a living, I'm pretty lucky to have thick skin. So <laughs> I only cry inside, not on the outside. That's the only thing that matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you can sum up your experience in the cannabinoid space in a main takeaway or lesson learned to pass on the next generation, what would it be? It's an economic opportunity that is unfettered. My kids are going to grow up in a world where cannabis is going to be larger than alcohol and accepted by more people and utilized more diversely. Hurry up and get us there instead of fighting for beliefs from 50 years ago. That would be one of the things I would love to see. Amen. That's well said. All right. Prediction time. I wrote this one on the fly, so I apologize for mumbling it. How do do we get the NAFTA, or formerly known NAFTA agreement, to allow for cannabis um, sales across U.S., Canada, and Mexico? And does it need federal legalization to occur? Great question. I, I am very involved with the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. I believe that the the chambers of commerce, uh, because they represent everybody in the supply chain, cultivators, retailers, ancillary businesses, is a great way to do it. 
I believe that the political um, relationships that he have with traditional economic actors representing it towards um, politicians who aren't thinking that it's just a cannabis company coming in there and whining for better policy that they could take advantage of to the point of the past. Um, and I would start with non-psychoactive cannabinoids like CBD, CBN, THC, because they're already approved in all three locations. So start there and then let's work to inebriance. When? Uh, the, the next USMCA review is in 2023. Let's roll up our sleeves and let's get her done. Right. Like, let's have a North American perspective. It's on the books. You pass the Farming Act. We have it federally leg- legislated and the Mexican federally leg- legislated. Have you heard one person talk about it? Why not? Why not? It's just a simple question to ask. So if we put it out there, maybe we can force it to actually be a part of the conversation. And from a, politi- a politician point of view, it's an agricultural product, not an inebriant. So maybe they feel safer doing it. Yeah, convince Governor Ricketts. Kellen, what do you think? I mean, first, we did pass the farm bill, but that did not seem to do much for CBD as far as rescheduling it or saying it's safe or really anything. It's still kind of in that gray area, you know what I mean? So (laughs) well, we should probably figure out what we're going to do with CBD first, and then we can kind of move forward, I guess. Um, But I think it does require federal legalization, honestly, at least on the U.S.'s part, because... The U.S. is going to just look like an outlier sitting at a table yes. with two countries that have robust, established, matured markets where even when we talk about representatives not knowing that there's still illegal vape products on the market, I mean, I can't even imagine the ignorance that the U.S. representatives approach that conversation with never even having a, a real marketplace to, to have cannabis wow. sales from a, a federal perspective. You know what I mean? And so... I don't think there is a conversation. I think the point is moot. Well, or it's like this. Yes. (laughs) Plug my ears and cover my eyes. So please go ahead and talk (laughs) about it. You know, like I I think that's probably where it at. But like Germany is going through adult use recreation. France is going through adult use recreation. Like these are not small other nations. These are traditional American allies who are going through that process. And you're surrounded on both borders. So it has to get there where you're not taking a political risk anymore. And it's a huge economic opportunity. So I I think it'll, when the light bulb turns, it'll go very quickly. Um, The question is, what is the policy that you get that you have to live within? Because I think when you rush, um, the consequences of rushing are more scary than taking the time. So that would be the one thing that I would worry about when America turns that light or or when flips that switch, what the policy will come out the other side, because the cannabis sector might advocate for the next five to 10 years to roll back some of the things that were embedded in the legislation during legalization. I agree with what you said, except the only caveat is you do have to do something. You can't just hang out and be patient (laughs) for the next 25 years. (laughs) We do eventually have to take a step forward. We can't just talk about it. Isn't there five bills in both houses? Like like, It's not like there isn't stuff to talk about. You know what I mean? Like there, there's... And I think it's, is it the majority of American yeah, states are 63% going through it? or something. 68. I think it was 68. Oh, it's... Yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, this is the most popular public policy position in the United States for the citizenry is cannabis legalization. At a certain time, maybe a politician's going to be like, wait a second. So 70% of people like this? Why aren't I jumping on that? Because I like 70% of Americans voting for me. So I think, you know, sometime hopefully we'll combine that, that political opportunism with common sense policy making. It, it seems like a layup, right? Like just to think about that, just from a statistical standpoint, you got to feel pretty good going in knowing, well, you know, seven out of 10 like it. I'm not going to feel good laying here. But what I never thought about until you said it, Nathan, was the international peer pressure that kind of goes into it, right? Because if the U.S. is being left out of these conversations because we can't get our act together, besides the economic standpoint that we'll miss out on God knows how much money, but like it's also an embarrassment as someone who kind of takes themselves as like the world leader, we need to be at the forefront of this. And if we're kind of sitting back because, whoa, we haven't got our act together, it's going to be kind of embarrassing. So I wonder if the cabinet or the political leaders help kind of push that a little faster to be like, hey, like these conversations are happening with or without us. We need to do something first so we can partake in these conversations because we would like to influence how that arrangement goes. And that might expedite the timeline a little differently than I ever thought. 
you're closer aligned with Russia and China than you are with Germany, France, Mexico, and Canada. Oh, my God. Just to throw it out there. Oh, my God. That one stinks. That one hurts. That one, <laughs> that one, <laughs> just to throw it out there. That one hurts. That one really, really hurts. I'll have to clip that and maybe remove it because that one's a little too painful for some of our <laughs> listeners. I mean, maybe our strategy is just let Mexico legalize it and they can grow it all and then we'll just import it. You know oh, yeah, that works so it. well. Raven, <laughs> somewhere Nancy is spinning in her grave somewhere. Oh, my God. It's terrible. Sorry, that, you should probably clip that one. But, yeah, it's so terrible. Just <laughs> help our trade deficit. It's true. It's true. I do have to run. I am really sorry. I would really love to carry the conversation, but I have to jump to another one. Thanks so much for your time, Nathan. Appreciate it. No problem. It was a real pleasure. I look forward to having it again, guys. Absolutely. Talk soon. Thanks. Be well. My name is Kira Reed, and I'd like to invite you to be inspired by the women who are leading in the cannabis industry. Each week, we will discuss empowerment, leadership, and what it means to be a woman in charge in marijuana, hemp, and CBD. As the founder of the Women Empowered in Cannabis community, I have had the great pleasure to get to know many brilliant and talented women who are CEOs, executives, politicians, advocates, and community leaders that are focused on creating a cannabis economy that is just, fair, and equal. We'll learn how these women make decisions, how they navigate a predominantly male industry, and what they're doing to level the playing field for women. I hope you'll join us.